This mail train is heading toward the industrial zone of our layout. The industrial zone is about 20 feet long. That's 1,740 feet in HO scale. While it's a bit more than many layouts for one section, it's not easy to make it seem like a vast area that is patterned after real life around 70 years ago. I chose to make nearly all of the industries flat relief models and much longer than most models. I remember factories and model railroads featured in magazines when I was a young man and it seemed like these factories were too small. I wanted to avoid that, so I supersized my factories. This train disappears to run into a building. It will show up on another area of the layout. The track in front of the Judson building is another main line that disappears around the curve to appear somewhere else. This layout is full of illusions to create the feeling of more spaciousness than there really is. Returning back to the other end, we will review the industrial zone starting with the ice deck to support refrigerator cars or reefers. It can ice six cars at a time. It is used to load 300 pound blocks of ice into the rooftop hatches of early refrigerator cars. The white building behind the wooden deck is where the ice is made. Usually this was a plain concrete structure with very few windows. Here's a view before the overhead canopy was added. These panels are hinged to drop down to the roof level where workers could slide blocks of ice into the ice bunkers and use a steel rod to break the blocks up into smaller chunks. Here's a large block of ice on a travel rack that runs the block to a location of a waiting reefer's open hatches. I made the travel rack from a black zip tie adding cleats that push the blocks along. They don't actually operate. This green contraption has a horizontal conveyor belt that runs blocks of ice from a hole in the wall to a synchronized lowering conveyor rack of machinery down to the deck's flooring. Lacking any detailed photos of a machine like this, I imagine how it could be approached. During my own engineering career, I have never designed this type of structure, so it may not be convincing to an expert. Anyhow, it was fun to imagine a solution. Here's a night shot with the overhead canopy in place. I still have plans to extend the deck to accommodate a few more cars, as time permits. Right now, the installation is around 32 inches long. All the lighting is by 2x3mm white LEDs. They are run with a very low 4 milliamps of current to keep the brightness at a lower level. The panels are hinged and posable, but I kept them up to avoid shearing them off when switching cars around. With this local pulling us away from the industries, let's review where these models portray back in time. The Oakland Bay Area was long ago crawling with industrial areas that employed many thousands of workers. They had steel mills, food processing, chemical plants, manufacturing of machinery and electrical goods, to mention a few. We'll borrow a few graphic maps from our two key system documentary DVDs. Along the path of San Pablo Avenue was a wealth of industries. The three orange lines were the SP main lines that acted like a magnet to factories on both sides of those tracks. The yellow lines were key system electric lines used by the Oakland Terminal to serve more industries. The line down Adeline Street brought the Santa Fe to its Emeryville yard as well. And the industrial corridor that I model stretched from West Oakland to Richmond, California, all along the San Francisco Bay water's edge. Next is an Albers mill to process grain-based food products. There really was an Albers plant on the SP's mole that jutted out into the bay. However, this model is loosely based on a smaller plant that was in Portland, Oregon. This complex takes up 36 inches of real estate. There's more information on this mill scene's construction details and parts sourcing on a link below to 1000 Model Railroad Ideas Building a Large Grain Mill. Next in line is the Westinghouse Manufacturing Plant. It's made from a Walther's kit called the American Hardware Supply. 
Here is a night view of the type of signage seen in the Bay Area in the 1950s. This model in flat relief used all the kit parts to extend from 13 inches to 32 inches long. The Westinghouse Company actually had a number of regional factories with very similar architectural styling. The company got its start inventing the railroad air brakes, then branching out to signals, traction motors, elevators and escalators, home appliances, power plant electrical hardware, and finally TVs and even jet engines. I set a trackside indentation for a loading platform to serve a siding. Two directional doorways allow forklifts to circulate without collisions. This platform can serve outbound goods and inbound supplies. An SP station has a house track to the right of the screen that leads to another grain factory. In the distance is a 48-inch long Del Monte food plant. The company in the Bay Area started with the name California Packing Company. They had a wealth of food packing plants in the Bay Area once upon a time. This flat relief model is over 48 inches long. The left-hand portion was made from design preservation models modules that are now available from Woodland Scenics. This food plant was a feature in a model railroader magazine in October 1980 that I wrote. Later in 1996, it was one of the fully planned sections of model railroader's book called HO Lineside Industries You Can Build. Don't forget to add numbers on your doorways for the railroad crew to know where to spot empty cars. I expanded the factory to the right using a more modern, modular style to represent a later expansion of the plant. Like most of these buildings, the implied notion is that the truck access and the parking for employees is on the hidden side of this building. We can only see the track side of these facilities from our viewing vantage point. The water tower is from a photo of a real model photoshopped with the added name Del Monte and reduced by around 20% in size and bonded to the painted backdrop to look more distant. It was all done in Photoshop. The same is true of the smokestack to the right. I used photos of industries printed in perspective views to fool the eye and create more depth to viewers between the buildings. The upper building behind the sign is really a photo of parts of the real model printed on flat finish photo paper and reduced by about 40% to look further away. After photoshopping the work, I cut it out and glued it on the painted backdrop. The lighted sign was casting a lighted area on the sky painted on the backdrop, so it seems more natural that the light would be cast on a printed distant building than the sky. LEDs light the interior. After passing the interlocking tower on the right, we can see the Sherwin-Williams Paint Factory. Behind it is a Beacon Storage Building. The animated neon sign was a feature of the real Sherwin-Williams Paint Factory that once operated in Emeryville, California. The sign was visible for miles at night until they moved out of California. The sign is from Miller Engineering. I fabricated the structure to hold it out of junk box parts and structural plastic shapes. The building was made from a Walther's Railroad Shop Kit, radically cut up and with Titchy Train Group windows patched in. The gray building to the left is a very flat relief of a generic building to just fill the space. The Beacons truck is heading to the Beacon storage building that helps fill the visual void to the curved backdrop. Here's a better look at it. It was scratch built from art illustration board and Titchy Train Group windows. It combines styling features seen in many smaller cities in California that were served by the Beacon storage company. There are three arched loading doorways that serve trucks. One of the two tracks serving the paint factory can accommodate a few tank cars with a pump house unloading zone and storage tanks. On the backdrop is a flat relief of a Heinz food plant with a walkway for employees to enter and exit the building. 
This brand was another factory along San Pablo Avenue where it crosses Heinz Avenue. The Judson Company began in 1882 and ran until 1986. They had buildings all over Emeryville and Oakland involved in steel and manufacturing assemblies out of steel. My Scratch Built Model is a steel stamping and bending shop that supplies steel punched chassis to the growing electronics industry for namely televisions and radios. Your biggest customer here is the General Electric Company plant next door. The Judson and GE plants have no rail access. They are served by trucks. However, those trucks can come from a team track and an unloading ramp for trucks not too far away. Not every factory needs a siding of its own. This is a main line that disappears around the bend where a caboose can be seen. The grain bins hide where the track is going. It pops out of a tunnel in another rural scene on another part of the layout. The grain bins are part of another food factory loosely based on the Nabisco shredded wheat plant that was once served by the Oakland Terminal Railroad on 14th Street in West Oakland. This is another scratch-built building made to resemble the West Oakland factory. It's a very large structure that was chosen to further view block where two separate main lines disappear into the unknown. The grain bins are from Walther's, and the concrete grain storage silo with the head house is Walther's number 933-2942, and it's an HO scale kit. Well, that wraps up the tour, but be sure to watch the following two videos on our DVD video products for model railroaders that actually come with plans you can print and full instructions. If you're serious about your layout plans, please subscribe and hit the like button to keep these videos coming. In this presentation, we feature models of the steam to diesel transition era. That would be something like 1955 or so. Our time will mostly be spent outlining building techniques and using various tools and materials that you might be unfamiliar with just yet. In this volume, we will see flat car, box car, and tank car construction. A fruit to reefer car loading complex. A rail bridge. A highway bridge plus simulating country road pavement. We outline construction techniques for low-cost structures, such as an abandoned country store and a railroad section house, too. A central theme covers scene planning and repurposing models built over the years before your layout is started. Many of these models, shown here, would still be appropriate in decades after the 1950s. That is especially true of the structures. Also, many of the techniques are useful in building or altering models in any era. The overarching thinking here is to adapt some less expensive resources into your plans and to build your skill set and expand your tool collection with the money you might save in the process. Whether you are still building models for a future layout or trying to design a layout with models already built, this might help your ideas to crystallize. In this presentation, we feature models of more freight cars from the 1940s to the 1960s. Many of these cars remained in use even into the 1970s. Most of the techniques and ideas used to build these older cars can work well on more modern rolling stock, too. In this volume, we will see ways to use low-cost materials to build classic gondolas, a variety of early-style covered hoppers, and some great looking freight car loads too.
For building construction, we have used a pair of affordable kits that we can build into one larger and very convincing grocery store that works into a smaller town setting from the 1940s to the 1970s. This model is fully lighted inside and out with long life, small, warm white LEDs. To aid in building this store, we use animated diagrams and the DVD has a printable documents folder with many diagrams and useful items you can print out to make these models. Another fine model of a walnut processing plant could just as easily serve almond, pecan, or various grain milling duties in the back area of a small city where the branch line track runs. Facilities like these from earlier days are still in use. Full plans are furnished that can be printed with dimensions and a duplicate set for printing out with no dimensions that can be bonded on to the materials needed to be cut for building. All the steps to fabricate this model are from our plans. This uses artist illustration board from any art supply dealer. It makes this basic model very inexpensive. All the interesting details are explained to bring realistic results. Any special materials or detail parts are identified by source and part number. By using basswood and glossy inkjet printer paper, Things like concrete freight platforms and other items are created with realistic effects. The scaled files are available to print in HO scale. Roof details are important and we use techniques to highlight the implementation of these items. A number of small detail parts are made from just bits of scrap material, so when they are painted, they have the right look. Rain downspout drains using scuppers are fabricated and installed to work with a slightly tilted flat roof. Many of these techniques can be used on many other buildings too. We show how to make things like concrete stairs and truck loading pads out of basswood. All the steps are in this video to build the model like this one including the signage. The basic pieces can be built into much larger models, and we explore that too. These sections can really make good flat models for scenic backdrops too. Let's look at some inexpensive rolling stock models, such as older plastic atherin and model die casting roundhouse models that are easy to improve, and we show just how. Building the freight cars from older, inexpensive Atherin Blue Box and model die casting kits are features in this video with guidelines on how to build very rewarding models. The theme here is to adapt some less expensive materials into your plans and expand your tool and technique resources in the process. The techniques are generally useful in building or altering models in any era. Whether you are still building models for a future layout or trying to design a layout with models already built, this might help your ideas move ahead. Look for many other DVD videos on our website covering rail topics of steam, diesel, plus electric interurban and streetcar systems from the past. From our archive and other resources, we use old film never seen before to create these productions, bringing history and beautiful scenes that you can no longer see. This is the homepage of our website. The numerous videos are on a number of pages, and in most cases, clicking on a DVD cover face will reveal a preview video for viewing. Thank you for watching.